In the UK, anyone can do it. Anyone can get a property and put it on Airbnb. And it's not regulated. Dubai is about 30 years ahead of us. But when you look at all the majority of millionaires in the world, what they eat is such an important thing. They've even hired a nutritionist. Not many people speak about it as well. There are very hard times being an entrepreneur. It's very lonely as well. It's a lot more stressful because... Today, I have an inspiring guest. She's only 21, but today she's turning a six-figure business. And we want to find out all about it. So I want to welcome Lena Ahmed. I have to wake up early. Those few hours in the morning, so from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., it's so quiet. You can get so much work done. You know, a lot of men, they feel intimidated by the amount of success they've achieved. But maybe they're just, you know, talking to the wrong men because... Today, I have an inspiring guest. She's only 21. She was already a broke uni student. But today, she's turning a six-figure business. And we want to find out all about it. So I want to welcome Lena Ahmed. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. Yes, lovely to have you on. Thank so you. where have you come from today? So I'm from Coventry, uh, born and bred. Uh, so... That's what did you did you travel from there this morning or uh, I drove I drove here. Uh, luckily there was no traffic, but it was all good. Nice, nice, nice. So I always like wonder what does a day or a week in the life of a young twenty one year old look like these days. What's what's happening in your world? Well, for me, I wouldn't say it's very. Um, what's the word? Where it's ge general with other twenty one year olds. Um, well, I think I don't think it is. Uh, so with my day in the life, I do short term rentals, aka Airbnb, where you know we find a house or an apartment, uh, we put it on Airbnb or Booking dot com, and we rent it out on a nightly uh, basis, um, and that's how we profit from that. <clears throat> so a day to day life uh, yeah. goes around that. So, like, how how regularly do you, does the business need you? Does it need you on a daily basis or do you go every couple of days or are you leveraging other people? Yeah. So with my units, they're actually based 30 minutes away from me. Um, so at first, I was doing a lot. I was doing the sales, the marketing, the operations, the cleaning. I, I was the cleaner at once. Um, but... Um, we decided to leverage different people in different um, aspects of the business. For example, having someone in for cleaning, having someone in for doing any maintenance, uh, because I'm not able to be there all the time. I want to be growing the business. So we put people in um, to leverage off them uh, who are better skilled at what they do. Uh, so I can focus on building the business and focus on relationships. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. But, you know, before we get into that bit, I want to hear more about how it was at the start, because you can only leverage people and get a team together once you have a bit of money, right? Yeah. And before that, you've got to be like a one person band, like you, you've got to be playing every single instrument. So, you know, how did you put your sort of first deal together? How did that thought come into your mind? How did you find a property? Yeah. So when I got my first unit, I was working at the time in Morrison's. Um, I was. It was during a gap year I took for university. Well, I didn't have a choice for the gap year. Um, if I take it back a little bit, I started university in September 2020. Uh, it was during lockdown, so, you know, there were no lectures, there, it was all online, um, so I didn't really get the full university experience, and I'm glad I didn't, I, I'm not really interested in, you know, the, the social life, I'm more interested in the entrepreneurial aspect, so um did my first year of uni, um, it, I, I studied law, um, it was uh, an all right year, it was, it was enjoyable to learn about law, um, but I, it, it always felt like there was something missing. Um, and then it got to the end of the year where we had to submit all our assignments. Um, at the time, I was in Portugal, um, just a normal holiday. Um, but I just I just didn't have the... I just didn't finish my assignments. So 
a few months later, I got a call saying, hi, Lena, unfortunately, not getting to the next year. I was, I was really shocked to hear it uh, because, of course, I'm, I come from an Asian background. I've got Asian parents. And I just thought in my head, oh, my God, what do you mean I'm not going to go to uh, next year? They said, well, you can do a gap year. And I always thought gap years weren't good. I always thought people take gap years because maybe they're bored and they're just trying to figure their life out I never saw myself as doing a gap year but there I was doing a gap year so what I did essentially is I, I wanted to start something of my own because like I said I always felt that there was something missing so I gave myself those 12 months of that gap year to find something to do uh, which ended up being this Airbnb business and um, I gave myself you know a 12 months I gave myself accountability if I don't do something within this 12 months then I guess I'll go back to university if I do then you know I'll take it from there but why property why Airbnb how did you know how to get into this how was this on your radar so I was following a few people on Instagram um where they were actually doing amazing in rent to rent rent to service accommodation and you know I was following it through from 2019 and it was something that I did want to get into um I saw it as an opportunity, you know, it's it's a people's business, uh, hospitality. Um, I like traveling, uh, traveling comes with hotels. I, I like the business, I like the business model. So I think with property, because it's got so many um, entry points, I chose service accommodation to do. And did you have to do a course to learn about that or did you have a mentor? No, so I was actually self self-taught uh, I never got a mentor it did take a lot of YouTube videos to watch a lot of books to read a lot of networking events to go to so again I'd go to a lot of property networking events because I didn't know anything about property uh, like I said I was only 20 or 19 at the time I knew nothing about property but I did know that I wanted to be inside property I wanted to you know have many properties to my name um, so I would go to a lot of property networks and networking events and I'd see I'd I'd hear of the thing called having Airbnb, rent to rent. And yeah, I just wanted to put my foot in and that's exactly what I did. So did you like automatically get attracted to Airbnb and the rent to rent system? Yeah, it was it was really attractive. It, I was looking at HMOs, but there was this one post that someone did there and then it was like where if some it, it was compa I don't believe in it now, but I, obviously when I was starting out so it was like there's this one post showing um, a person that ha owns Airbnbs and they have a partner and another person that owns uh, HMOs and they have a partner and it's just saying like oh uh, hey partner come look at this uh, come to my place and they take them to a nice Airbnb and then this person takes them to like a like a one room HMO I, I don't know it just looked more um lucrative to me at the time and I just saw it as something that I could definitely grow towards. Did the um, interior design aspect sort of appeal to you as well, as well or, or wasn't that a factor at all? It was yeah just it, it, appeared, it appeared massively. Um, I've been with interior designing, um, my partner, my business partner deals more with that but I did like the aspect of it. I did like how you know <clears throat> designing a place just like this place here it's, it's nicely designed I, I liked how people would choose your place based on how it's designed based on how much uh, amenities you can offer and you know I I want we I want to be the best at what I do and I feel like with hotel in the hotels business in the short-term rental business if you appear to be the best then you will get more customers coming in to stay with you Mm, definitely definitely so what did your first deal look like how did you find your first rent to rent like, I mean look you're very young um I don't know certain people could look at you and go what you want to rent my place how have you got the money how do you got the credibility I'm not even sure if I can do a reference check on you how did you overcome all of these things yeah so it, it's crazy when I, I do think about it because at the time I was only earning 300 to 400 pounds a month from my part-time job uh so it wasn't a lot and of course the first rent that I was going to be paying to my landlord uh, for the short-term rental business was 800 pounds a month of course when the landlord sees that I'm only earning this amount and I'm having to pay him uh, double nearly double 
well, double the amount, he's not going to trust me. But how it went is I I went on the viewing to view the property. Uh, before I went on the viewing, I did my analysis to check if the area will work for me. Uh, I checked the location. I checked nearby transport a areas, transport links. Uh, I checked um, surrounding competition. And based on that, I thought it was a good property to go ahead with. Uh, I booked the viewing with the landlord. So it was direct to landlord, uh, direct to vendor. Um, and I told him on the phone, I want to do this with the property. Are you open to it? And he said to me, come to the view and we'll talk more about it. So he had about, I think, 20 different other people, potential tenants that uh, were viewing the property because it was a nice property um, in the area. Um, and then I went to the viewing. I, I dressed up nicely. I made sure I smelt nice. Just making sure that um, appearance is appearance on point because it does play a massive factor um, how you appear to other people, especially when it's first impression. Um, so uh, I went to him. I said, "So I actually I'm looking to work with more corporate clients. Uh, so I work with different companies like Coca-Cola, uh, the NHS. Uh, these are companies that I do actually work with now." Uh, we have a few contracts with them where they can stay with us for accommodation. But at the time, I just said it because I knew I'll be working with them in the future. Uh, so I said that we'll be looking to work with these corporate clients and they will be staying with us. Uh, I explained it to him. I made sure I was confident. Uh, I made sure everything I was saying was consistent. And I just saw his face. He, he just kept nodding his head and he was smiling a lot. And I saw his face that he he was he was getting excited about what I was saying to him. Now, a lot of other people, they say with rent to rent, landlords run away when they hear the word rent to rent Airbnb. They, they literally shoot out the door when they hear someone asking to do that. But with this landlord, he was open to it. And, um, and yeah, he said, okay, that's, that's brilliant. And I went home, uh, put my offer in, sent the contract to him and, then it got to the referencing stage where they have to reference your background. They have to credit check you. I, I um, got rejected for the referencing stage. It said on the referencing thing that it said, um, proceed at your own risk. So it said that on the landlord's side. Um, and he said to me, hey, Lena, it came back as this, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you. He basically said that he's going to trust me. And yeah, that's it. That's how it came forward so he trusted me even though I wasn't I couldn't meet the affordability rate of the apartment See, that's really important what you've just said there because that's a scenario where it's the computer said no yeah Do you know what I mean the computer said no but it required a human to override that decision because of the potential he can see and the machine cannot see he can see this you know young you know uh, well-presented young lady um, she's got a vision, she's got something new to bring to the market. And maybe he thought, actually, you know, um, wh why do you think he chose you? What were the factors do you think that sold it to him? So I actually met him six months after where, you know, where the landlord wants to see the apartment or house. They want to check how everything's been with their tenant. So he did the six month check on me. He came to the apartment with his partner and his children and I he saw the apartment and it looked probably better than it was when um, he first gave it to me because of course with um, short-term rentals we have a lot of cleaners in we have our maintenance team so it's always being looked after there all our landlords property are always being looked after we always vet our guests so yeah that's why after he saw that I, I did ask him you know why did you go ahead with me? Why, what was it? Even though I didn't meet the affordability rate, what was it? He said to me it was the communication so um, and the confidence as well, So and especially the communication. So when I was going back and forth with him on WhatsApp, on calls, I was replying to him on, on good time. I was being professional with everything. Um, and I actually, he actually told me his previous tenant was horrible with communication. They weren't paying rent on time. He'd have to chase him. There was also a language barrier. Um, so he said to him, communication was a massive thing. Uh, I think that's why he went ahead with me because I was making sure that I was being as professional as possible. So, um, yeah. Amazing. Great. I'm, I'm sure a lot of 
people in the audience right now can probably say, do you know what? I might not have the best cards right now. It may not look like the odds are stacked in my favor, yeah. but things can happen if my attitude is right, if I communicate well, present myself well, um, and that maybe that's 50% of the job done. Would you agree? Yeah, I do agree 100%. It comes with, he, he, I think he saw the drive I had. I was really, um, it, it, I just wanted to take that action. I, I was really determined to get this first deal. I had a lot of no's before that. And I just thought to myself, this is not going to be another no. I was just tired of the no's. So how do you see failures when you was getting all these no's? What made you get back up? And how did you determine that you wasn't going to get another no really? So when I first started doing my calls to agents and landlords, I, I, they just kept saying no. And I was thinking, well, there's no way not, well, not one person is gonna, it's gonna wanna go ahead with me. Uh, but it was really upsetting. It, it did really put me down when everyone would just be like, no, we don't do that, goodbye. No, uh, sorry, we've, we've dealt with this before, but goodbye. They just hang the phone up. And I, of course I'm at home, I'm getting a bit heated. And it just wasn't the best. But I think the, the one thing that overcame it was I, I saw this quote where it said, you know, you're only, you know, you don't know how close you are to the diamond. So it's like there, there's just two people that are breaking the diamond. One person gave up and he was just one axe away from pick getting to, away. yeah, pickaxe away from getting the diamond. <laughs> so I saw that and I thought, you know, I don't know if, if I give up today, I don't know whether I, I could have gotten the yes tomorrow. So I think that helped me to make sure to stay consistent and just be persistent. Massively. I love that. I love that. Because do you know what? There's not much difference between failure and success. Yeah. There really isn't. Because you could have failed and that next try could have been success, right? So what was really the difference? Someone just tried one more time? So I totally agree with you there. Um, so you've got the keys in your hands now. He's done the deal with you. And everyone's left. It's just you and this apartment and some keys. What do you do? Yeah, so I, I literally remember it. Um, so he gave me the keys on the day. <coughs> um, I was just signing everything in the apartment. It was a completely empty apartment now. He's removed all the furniture. Um, so I got the keys and I just thought to myself, okay, now what? Because again, I'm self-taught. I didn't have a mentor at the time. So I didn't really know what to do. Um, I called Uzma, so at the time, um, who she is now, she's now my business partner. But at the time, of course, I've known Uzma since I was uh, a little kid. Uh, we've known each other since primary school. So I called her and I said, look at this, I've got keys to an apartment. Of course, when you're a 19-year-old, um, you're both 19-year-olds, you're saying, oh, wow, we've got keys to an apartment. And then it just, it just reality hits you where, okay, I need to be making sure that this apartment's ready in time. I need to put it on the market in time. So all these different aspects in business, I didn't know about. I'm new to it. I'm fresh in the game. Uh, all these different things like sales, marketing, operations, uh, fulfillment, all these things were about to hit me um, back into reality where I need to get my game on. So it was nerve wracking and it was a bit scary where I was left alone in the apartment now. Uh, it all came down to that. Um, and yeah, it was really scary. So what did you do? Uh, so it took me about a month uh, to furnish that apartment. And how, how did you finance it? Uh, so it was from uh, primarily from savings. So I saved up uh, all my student finance. I never spent a penny of it. Um, even in my part-time job at Morrison's, I, I, would, I barely spent a penny of it. Um, because I wanted to save up for something, save up for, at the time I thought it was like a, I wanted to save up for a side hustle. I don't believe in the word side hustle anymore, but um, that's what I was thinking at the time. Um, and I managed to save up about 8,000 pounds. I saved up about 8,000 uh, pounds within a year. Um, and did that all go on furniture? Yeah, it like five thousand pounds of it all went on furniture. So wasn't you scared? Like the rent is what eight hundred pounds? Did you say eight hundred pounds more? Eight hundred pounds of the the rent, the and you've just well. you've 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 spent six seven times that amount on this investment now. Yeah, that wasn't you scared? I was very, I was very scared, but I just thought to myself, what's the risk mitigation here? Um, if I 
if I lose it all, I can just spend another year of working to get it back. So I didn't see it much as a risk. I saw it as me, you know, finally taking action, taking the risk, and it all did pay off. But every time I go to Dunham, every time I go to you know, all these furniture shops, I'm swiping my card, swiping my card. It was it was a horrible feeling because I'm spending all this money and I don't even know if it will be worth it. But um, I knew that it is a low risk. It's only £5,000, which isn't a lot. Uh, I, if, it, if it all fails, then I'll just save up the next year and start again until it, it I find success of it. Okay, so what did you do to this place? New curtains? So, um, of course, it's completely unfurnished. So I painted up the whole place. Um, so, again, a one-man band uh, painting all the, the wall. The walls were already white, but I painted it white again. I'm not sure why. Again, I'm just starting up. I don't know. I've got no mentor. I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm just painting the walls white Did again. Did it make a difference? I, no, it didn't. Um, there were a few marks, you know, when, uh, a few fair wear and tear, but it's something where... If I, if, from all my experience I've gained today, I wouldn't waste, I think it was five days which I wasted on just painting alone. So I wouldn't do that again. But, you know, we all start from somewhere. Yeah. But um spent about five days painting and then another two to three weeks um, black packing. Again, today, and you even know that these two things you can even, you can just hire someone on a daily rate and they'll get it done within three days. Uh, so I did waste all that time, but it was a massive learning curve. Um, I learned how to do wallpaper. I didn't know how to do wallpaper before. I learned how to flat pack. So a lot of skills were gained, but these skills, I don't think I really need them uh, for the future. But it was a great learning curve. And how did you go about the interior design of the place? Or how did you know how you wanted it to look? Did you go on a course for that did you just look at a magazine how other people are doing it did you look at your competition on the airbnb how did you go about yours so i i did it very simply um i got four main colors i got i got um blue red green and yellow mustard yellow i got those four colors uh, of of furniture i put it on my instagram and i said I, I captioned it one two and three and four i said guys pick which one looks the best for furniture Everyone picked blue, so I just picked blue as the main base for the furniture. So I started getting blue sofa. I painted one of the bedroom walls blue, blue wallpaper. And I think that was, it was as simple as that. There was no um, crazy thing behind it. I don't come from an interior design background. I didn't want to spend too much time of it. So I just did that. Okay. So one month on, the property's all ready. How do you market this place now? Yeah, so I marketed it straight onto Airbnb. Um, I also marketed it on Booking.com. I didn't have my own website for direct bookings. Um, I wish I did, but I didn't at the time. Um, again, I don't come from a SEO background, um, but at the time I, I marketed it on Airbnb. It was January, so this is normally quiet season in the UK. Um, and... It was getting a few bookings, but I didn't. I think I, that first year, that first month alone was a loss. I think I only just broke even, uh, and then I decided to. And how did you know how much to market your place for? Uh, so again, I I free handed everything. Um, I I put it up for ninety pounds a night. Um, I put I put it up higher now, but at the time I put it up at ninety pounds a night. I was just comparing it with a competition, what they're charging, what the hotels are charging. So a lot of research does go into it, a lot, a lot of research does. And this was a lot of free research. I didn't have to spend any money on market researching. Um, I simply went onto Airbnb, booking.com, look at what other people are charging and just charge something in a similar rate. But what I should have done is add a few more things in the apartment, a few more eye-catching things in the apartment and then charge slightly higher than what other people are marketing in the air. That's what I should have done, but now I know to do that. Like what sort of features could you have added? So in, in a few of my apartments now, we've got pool tables in, we've got arcade machines in, 
what else do we have we have um balconies we've got artificial grass on the balconies so all these little things they do play a massive part in gaining um, a potential guest mm, attention absolutely i mean if i'm sharing with a couple of friends an apartment or something and and something's like just a little bit more expensive but it's got a pool table it's like hey i don't need to go out the full night before yeah. we go out we can have a few drinks here have a couple of games here and then we can also so it's actually saving you money as well like if you think about what your client wants right yeah something like that. oh that sounds really good um so how what periods were you having them booked was they just daily bookings that you were getting or were people booking them for a week or two weeks or three days what 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 sort of bookings was you getting so it was just uh it was dailies so i'd get two nights three nights four nights and at the time i didn't have a cleaning team so and this apartment it's 30 minutes away from where i live um so i was having to after after two days after three days after even even one day i was the cleaner I'd go to the apartment, I'd travel 30 minutes, I'd go to the apartment, clean the place up. I'm not a professional cleaner. Um, I'm not trained to be a cleaner. So I'm I'm trying my best to clean it up to standards. And then, of course, I'd go home after three hours of cleaning. Um, but it, it was difficult how I was putting it on for two and three nights. Now I've got about, a, I've got a seven night minimum stay. So this attracts a bit more longer term bookings now. Um, but I don't really recommend the two free nights because a lot of people come to party. They use it for uh, illegal use. Uh, they just don't use it in the right way where a seven night tap. So did would... you have any bad, what was your worst incidents at the beginning when you when people were taking it on short term? So my apartment would only sleep five people, but we've got we've put a wing camera at the door, and we've also got a noise detector. So of course, these two things I also told the landlord about. That's why he was happy to hear that. Um, but I had this ring camera, and a, a guest was staying for one night. Uh, I got a notification on the. It's called a minute detector, minute noise detector. It, it can detect um, the decibels of the noise. I got a notification and it was saying that it's loud noise. Of course, after 10 p.m., we have a strict loud noise policy. So I checked the ring camera and I could see about 20 people going in all at once. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going on? And it, of course, they were having a gathering slash party. <clears throat> so I had to arrange uh, security uh, at the time to just kick them out. And yeah. How do you arrange security? Um, well, it, he wasn't security at the time. He was my linen provider, so he'd provide all the bed sheets. And of course, I, I I do it myself. But of course, I'm I. It's like twenty guys against one girl. They're not. They're gonna take the mick out of me if I try and kick them out. So of course, I I rang my linen provider. I said, I need your help today. I'll pay you, uh, because the with with security callouts, we take the security deposit. Um, that's with that's put in the policies um so we charge about 250 pounds for the um security call outs uh, we give many warnings before that but if they ignore all the warnings then so did yeah. you give a warning yeah we gave about you know four warnings uh within a space of with about in a space of about about one to two hours so it was enough time of course. and he wasn't listening yeah they weren't listening. i even rang them to say listen I'm giving you a chance. Uh, can you please leave the apartment? Because it's not fair on the neighbours yeah. if there's loud noise. And what were they saying? Uh, luckily, the neighbours never said anything. The neighbours are quiet. But if the neighbours do say something, then it can affect me, my contract with the landlord, my relationship with that. It can affect a lot of things. That's yeah. why we put this policy of in course. place. Yeah. Um, and the furniture is not suitable for 20 people. So You're you can imagine your goods. Yeah, that's you can imagine. That's worth more than two hundred and fifty. Yeah, it is. Pounds, yeah, it is. So I am putting a lot on the line. So I gave him one to two hours. And right now, we only give thirty minutes now, but I gave him a lot of time. They ignored everything. And you got onto that pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, because of course it's my first unit. It's basically my baby. So yeah. I, I, I'm really checking everything. So. Yeah, I rang him and he managed to go there. He's already from Birmingham, so he went there. I also went as well because uh, I want to check if there's any damages in the apartment. Mm. But um, I paid the security person £100 
um, for the security call out. And then, yeah, that there was actually damage and it didn't cover the, the rest of the 150 pound. It didn't cover the damages. But now I've learned to make sure that I to better get, vet the guest, check everything, check IDs, check uh, making sure that they're given the security deposit. Just check that, you know, suitable guests are staying in the property and not it, that making sure that won't happen again. Mm -hmm. Any other incidents that you've had? Uh, we've had a few more of those. We've had a few more of those where, you know, they weren't properly vetted. Um, but I wouldn't say anything crazy. Uh, we've had What's... a few people smoking in the property. Of course, we charge for that. And then we get a device that gets rid of all the smell. But nothing crazy. Okay. Well, that seemed pretty crazy to me, having a massive problem yeah. with all these people you don't know and could be potentially damaging all your furniture and goods or your hard work and efforts. But um, what did it actually feel like when month two came, month three came, and you started getting more full? Yeah. So, you know, February, March, it's starting to get a bit more busier. Um, I think it was my third month where... I got a massive long-term booking in. It was someone it was coming from Portugal, I think it was. They come from Portugal. They're coming to, uh, but they were coming to the area for relocation. So a lot of people from different countries, they come to the UK because they're looking to find a new house, start a new life, find a new job. So these people, they came to um, the area, the UK, um, to put in um, a new job role for other people. So, of course, they're creating that. So th that's when I started to look more openly on the different types of guests that come and stay in the UK. Because I'm from the UK and I don't think anyone would want to come visit the UK because uh, that, that's our culture. We, we don't think, we always say, oh, the UK is horrible, the UK is this and that. But it's actually a massive market. It's got a massive hospitality market. Hospitality is the second biggest, um, one of the second bi biggest industries in the UK. I think the first one is real estate, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second one is hospitality. So there's always going to be a market for hospitality. A lot of people get scared of saturation. They get a lot of, they get scares of, you know, will this work or will this not? Every year, 40 million people are coming into the UK. Over 40 million people are coming to the UK to stay for hospitality. Um, so yeah, th that was my first guest that stayed for two months. And then again, I got another two months and it just started rolling like that. And what is the difference? Like, why weren't these people just renting a normal house as opposed to yours? Yeah, so with um, a lot of international guests, they aren't able to um, rent an actual residential property. The reason being the minimum is six to 12 months um, and they don't have the right visas in place. They don't have the right documents in place. They have to come to the UK first to ensure that they can get the right documents in place. Now, this process can be one to three months or even more. So they need somewhere to stay while they're doing that. So I think that's where we found our market of international guests coming in, where they're looking to move into the UK, uh, but they just need accommodation while they're doing that. And that's still on Airbnb and Booking.com. Yeah, so there's different platforms like Agoda, um, VRBO, HomeAway. There's different platforms, but I'd say Airbnb and Booking.com are the biggest platforms. Right. And do you have like a platform that posts it on all of the platforms for you? Uh, yeah, there, there are some platforms that do that. Um, at the moment, we're looking at more direct bookings, but they're, uh, I think it's called Travel Nest. So when you go on to Travel Nest, it allows you to advertise it, upload it once onto Travel Nest, and then it uploads it onto many different websites that um, I haven't even heard of. Yeah, cool. So instead of like £800 like you're paying, like a normal tenant would be, you're what, earning what, three times that amount? Yeah, yeah, we'd be earning about... So that property now, it generates about uh, £3,000 per month revenue. And of course, after bills and everything... And after rent, it comes to about £1,000 profit per month. What do you have to include? The cleaners are included? The cleaners go and clean so, it? Yes. Yeah, so, the, so the guests, they pay for the cleaning. It's um, included in the 
it's an additional cost that they have to pay. So they pay per night and then they pay for the cleaning on top of that. Okay, okay, nice. And when did you start scaling this business then? So once that first one was going well and you could see that actually it's profitable, I've got something here. Did you have to wait to re recuperate some of your cost back first, with that £5,000 initial layout, or did you go again before that? So I got my next unit in April. So everything I made, just reinvested it back in. Um, I didn't use any of the profits for myself. Um, I haven't even broken even from the initial setup cost of £5,000. I haven't even broken even from that. But I saw how lucrative it is and summer is go was going to come and it was going to get start to get busy. So I wanted to make sure I have a u another unit in for, for the summer rates to come in. And it was in Birmingham. And in Birmingham, they... It was the Commonwealth Games. Um, of course, I was seeing a lot of people charging £500 a night for these Commonwealth Games uh, dates. Um, it was in July. So I wanted to make sure I had as many units uh, before this date because, um, you know, people are charging £500 to £1,000 a night. Uh, so we, I made sure to get the next unit by April and the money used was just the, um, everything I earned from there into the next one. Wow. Okay. And what did your second deal look like? So this second deal was, uh, it was a massive three bed house in a new build. Uh, so again, it's new to me, um, being in a brand new house that's just been built a year before. Um, and again, the landlord, I, I came with the same approach to the next landlord, made sure uh, my parents was amazing and just came again with confidence and, they were also open to it as well. They they actually knew about Airbnb and they I think they had a lot of other people inquiring about the same thing. Uh, but they just went ahead with us because, again, they liked how we were conducting ourselves at the viewing. They liked how, you know, how friendly we were being. We were cracking our jokes here and there. Um, there was a lot of things that we could relate to um, at the viewing uh, and they moved forward with us. And I think this was our one of our <clears throat> biggest deals because it's uh, the profits it's generating it's it's probably generating the most out of all of them you mentioned uzi came to one of your first deals sorry it's uzma uzma sorry yeah. um when did she become part of the business so she became a part of the business um during the first unit so of course like i said to you um i showed the keys and i, I introduced her to everything that's going on what service accommodation is and she actually started helping me to set up this unit um without getting paid she 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 wasn't asking for anything she was just helping me as as a friend would and you know she'd stay she was working at costco at the time and she'd finish her shift at 10 p.m after 10 p.m we'd go straight to birmingham uh to finish this unit so you know, of course, it meant a lot to me where she's doing all this work. For, she's doing all this work for me. And, you know, I haven't told her I'm paying her. I haven't told her she's getting a wage. You know, it's just free labor I'm getting out of her. But, um, yeah, I, I think it was the set when we got the second unit. Um, I said to her, Uzma, listen, do you want to do this together? Because, you know, the first unit is working. But um, are you open to doing this with me? So she said, of course, yes, because it's it's exciting to, you know, work together, you know, childhood friends were literally best friends. It's, it's exciting to work together as business partners now. So that's where it all started from, where she got introduced to it. Why did you think you needed a partner? Um, I feel like she's she's good at, she's got her strengths and stuff. I've got my strengths and stuff. And her strengths is interior designing uh, she just has an amazing eye for you know furniture sourcing and my strengths is negotiations uh, building relationships with landlords building relationships with estate agents developers I'd say and of course if I've got someone to help me with interior design and if Usman's got someone to help her with negotiation it just comes together and you know it we manage to build and scale faster than uh, I would have done on my own why do you think a lot of partnerships break down? So um, 
I think because a lot of disagreements do happen and of course me and Uzma we have to separate our friendship and we have to also separate our business so it does get difficult at times because let's say we argue as best friends tomorrow we have to turn up as to, we have to turn up to work together so it does get difficult but at the same time it does help us to build a stronger relationship um you know we have to, we, it's basically us growing together and just being as mature as possible not getting uh hurt about any little arguments that we ha have we just have to grow up the next day and get back to work mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting it's interesting because sometimes when there's two people from two different backgrounds coming together and they could be very good friends but when you have to work together and there's like pressures on each other sometimes it can explode you know um, yeah and so one of the things that you mentioned was you know Uzma for quite a long while as well so you knew her maybe some of her good habits bad habits yeah. her temper how she'd react in most situations would you say yeah I, I, <clears throat> it's a difficult one because um you know you, you you have a lot of arguments but it's just is this argument worth losing this business because if me and her aren't working if we're moody then this business isn't going to work Something so at stake. we really have to mature up and we really have to get over the argument that we've had we need to talk about the argument we need to have good communication about you know why did this argument happen in the first place and i'm not gonna glamorize it you know we have really bad arguments at times um you know it is hard to work with someone where you know sometimes we don't have the same agreements it's difficult but it's just more about how much you you want this business to work how much you want this business to grow is it worth this little argument to um you know put the business down or is it worth to talk about the argument talk about you know how we can next time deal with things better and then grow the business even more and then work as a team for sure you said you've done a lot of your deals direct to vendor how do you find landlords so uh what do you mean sorry so you did you find these landlords through agents or did you find these landlords directly so i'd find them directly and it, it does come to a lot of sometimes you can go to these different apartment blocks Sometimes you see um, houses, it says to let, it has a to let sign on there. And you could, it just simply goes down to go into the area and just looking at, you know, all, looking for all these different clues where, you know, other people are operating, trying to see whether there's any other uh, apartment blocks that are free. And it comes down to, you know, speaking to maybe neighbours saying, hi, I can see this, this um, apartment is for let. Uh, do you have any information about the landlord? Uh, we also use a, a website called Open Rent, where we um, can directly uh, talk to landlords. So landlords use Open Rent to advertise their listings on, uh, and it's it's a good platform to you know get as many landlords contacts as we can. Because you know landlords are pitching on there, so yeah. you can just speak to them directly. Yeah, oh, it makes a lot of sense. How difficult has it been to do some of your deals? being an Asian woman do you think that makes a difference um I'd say it's more internal difficulty so of course I come from an Asian background it is um, an ethnic minority um so at times you do feel like you know because you don't see a lot of successful women you just think in your head how come there's not a lot of successful women is it something that we have that's not good enough or uh, how come there's not a lot of success, successful Asian women? Is it something that we have that's not good enough? Uh, it's just, it, but all you need to understand that a lot of these things come internally and it comes from culturally, cult, cultural, sorry, I can't speak. It comes from a, a culture background where <clears throat> all these beliefs that you've had in your head growing up, um, it, it does stick in your mind a lot. But when you look at people like Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, you know they're they're grown white men. Um, of course, you you can argue that they come from a better background, but I believe that what they have is no different to me. Um, they both have. I have a brain. They have a brain. Um, they've got two eyes. I've got two eyes. 
um, why is it that, um, I, why can't I be on the same level as them in the next 10 years? And there's no reason why I can't be uh, because, um, you know, I'm no different to them and they're no different to me. We're all humans. Um, I just need to work more harder on the, on the same level as they work hard. I can't slump around and think, oh, I, I come from an Asian background. I'm never going to make it in life, you know. Um, and a lot of people do think that, um, especially uh, with footballers. Uh, a lot of uh, Asian boys, um, they do footballing, they, they do football while they're young and then they just give the whole career up because, you know, um, there's, there, there is a lot of difficulty in getting into the, the league, uh, the football league for um, for Asian men. Uh, but I think with, although there is a lot of um, difficulty in getting uh, into, you know, the industry that we want to get into, uh, I feel like it does come down to working more harder. And sometimes coming from an ethnic minority, sometimes we do have to work more harder than others. Um, but I don't see any difference between me and Elon Musk. The only difference I see right now is I need to work a lot more harder. I need to put on a lot more hours uh, and just stay dedicated and consistent. Um, and then that should you know, take me to where I want to be. Yeah, definitely. And you need to sleep at the office like he does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. All, all good. You sound like a very strong, ambitious woman. You sound like in the partnership, you're the one who's out there doing the deals, negotiating. And it takes a special type of person to do that, Lena. So take me a little bit back in time down memory lane and tell me a little bit about how you were growing up and your influences around you, some of your courses, etc. So let's just say you're 10 years old now. What are you doing? So um, so I was only 10 years ago, crazily, when I was 10 years <laughs> old. Um, but Bomb. at the time, I of course, I was in primary school. And uh, I can't really speak much for my, my 10 year old self, but I just remember wanting to be the best. Um, there'd always be times where I'd come second for, for things and it, it, it would get to me why, you know, I wouldn't be first for, I wouldn't come first for things. Uh, so it would drive me to be, you know, a stronger person, work a bit more harder, and then you can get to that point. What were your parents doing? So my, my mom would work in a nursery school and my dad, he works in a restaurant. Okay. Yeah. He he works at the restaurant, or he's got any ownership in it. Uh, he he has a slight ownership in it, uh, but um, I wouldn't say we come from the most wealthy background. I'd say it's low, very low middle class. I'd say uh, so. We haven't always come from a wealthy background, and you know when when you come from not the best background, um. I feel like you have a, a bigger drive than the ones that do come from a wealthy background. And, um, you know, of course, w with my, where I live, um, it's not the best area. So opposite my house, it's like, it's drug dealer central. A lot of drug dealers come and, you know, they, they drive the cars, cars in, they like do look, a lot of swaps. <clears throat> so I don't come from the best background and I don't want to stay in that background. I want to um, break the ceiling. I, I want to, you know, get away from the area. I want to get, I want to live a better life. And uh, there's nothing wrong with wanting to live a better life, uh, making sure maybe my children will live a better life. Um, it's just um, coming from not the best background. It, it just opens your eyes a lot to compare to people that do come from the best background. Um, and yeah. Because maybe you got a situation where you're like, I know how bad this is and how bad it can get. I never want to see them days again. Yeah. And so sometimes we're running away from that sort of lifestyle, which drives us to the successful part. Yeah, right? interesting. Um, you got many siblings? Yeah, so I've got um two brothers. I've got one older and one <coughs> younger. Okay, okay. And what 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 do they do? Um, so my older brother, um, he's just. Uh, graduated university um which I never got to do um but um he's graduated university and I think he's got a secure full-time job and my younger brother he's just in uh sixth format I think right now okay so you're you're the 
basically Middle. yeah and you're the entrepreneur at all of yeah. them all of them um what were your some of your first side hustles or jobs um what i'd say when i was um 16 um i did join like <clears throat> an affiliate marketing uh thing where of course uh you'd have to sell and it would, you'd grow from there so like a pyramid course, scheme or something yeah pretty much i'd say yeah pretty much um although uh, although it wasn't um a lot of people have a lot of uh, thoughts on pyramid schemes um i just saw it of course i'm 16 at the time i just saw it as selling something and just growing from there um but at the time we uh, i'd have to travel to london so of course being 16 a young girl traveling to london uh, i wouldn't tell my parents what i'm doing because you know they're just going to say what are you doing go back to school um but i was doing affiliate marketing at the time and i never succeeded in it i failed in it um and i feel like i just tell everyone what i'm doing but i wouldn't actually be doing it so i feel like the difference for me uh, starting that small little business um, to me now is the difference was that I took the action. Uh, I put my, I basically put my money where my mouth is. I, I made sure I'm, I'm walking the talk. Everything I'm saying, I'm doing. Uh, I think that's the biggest difference uh, I've done. How much do you turn over now, like on a sort of yearly basis? So right now. Um, I've got 15 uh, rent to service accommodation and they cash flow about 800 pounds profit per month. Um, I don't really like talking revenue because uh, revenue is not really how much you make. I, I like talking about profit, however. Yeah. So I'd say on a yearly basis, it's 800 times 15, which is just under 15K per month, uh, uh, which I'm getting on a monthly basis. And then fifteen thousand pounds times twelve is um, well, one hundred eighty thousand. Yeah, so I'd say that's how much I'm turning around on a yearly basis. And do you, is that money yours? Do you take that out? Do you leave it in the business? So most of it stays in the business, and it always gets reinvested back in. Um, so I I've only just started taking a wage, uh, but that whole year I was working completely for free. How much do you pay yourself? So I pay myself right now, um, I think the, there's like um, a threshold where you can get, uh, so my accountant has recommended to do this, uh, where you pay yourself per month 1,000 pounds, about 1, just over 1,000 pounds. And that stays under the threshold of being tax free. So he's done this because... 12,517 yeah. is what you can earn without paying any tax. Yeah. Oh. So he's done this to bring my yearly tax end down. Uh, so I pay myself that and I also take dividends out as well. Mm -hmm. um, but most of my most of the money that we're making, it always, reinvests, it always gets reinvested back in. And some of your daily expenses, are you running them through the company? Yeah, so I, I, I do run uh, a lot of my... So the food that I eat, um because i work from home uh a lot of the food i eat does uh expense it's expense from the company my ca my car petrol um is expense for the company for example my drive here today it's expense through the company uh well, so it's work essentially isn't it yeah it basically is work you've got yourself in a position where you've got a passive income right now so you're still getting money while you're here yeah 100 percent. and yeah i think that's I think that's one of the reasons why I started this. I did what I wanted freedom. I wanted um, I can be where I want, and I'm making money at the same time. Um, I think that's the main reason why I'm doing this. When you got your first rental, was it under a company? Did you open open a company there and then? So yeah, I I I. I I went through a few Facebook groups um, again, being self-taught, I was using all resources that I had to get as many free information as I could. I wouldn't do that now because I, I prefer getting mentors to get me at a higher level. But at the time I used Facebook groups and on the Facebook group, it said to start a limited company and then get the rent to rents. Uh, so all my rent to service accommodations are in my company's name. Okay, and how did you open that company? Did you get a tax advisor or? Um, so I didn't get a tax advisor, but I would recommend to get a tax advisor. 
uh, and an accountant as well for advice. But um, it only cost me, the UK is brilliant for starting a business um, because it's so cheap to do it. It's about £12 to register your limited company. In Dubai, it's about £10,000. So there's a massive difference. But yes. <clears throat> the UK is great for, you know, fueling starting a starting business. <laughs> that's a bit of I think because you're in a different side of business right now yeah. um, I had Rob Moore here yesterday yeah and he was like I said what's the biggest barriers and stuff and he goes that government yeah. they want to tax me 45 percent oh yeah they want to tax me on this they want all of our money the more I earn in entrepreneurship the more they want to tax me like they don't want me around <laughs> yeah yeah that, 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 that's honestly I'm not a fan of I, I do believe you know if you earn more yeah you should pay more tax but not 45 percent just because you know 45 percent of two hundred thousand pounds and then 20 percent of 20k you know you, you can see who's paying more and it, i think it's not fair it's not fair if you know you work so hard and you've made all this money just for half of it to go to the government but for startup businesses um you know it's all good but i feel like with the uk government yeah, it's it, it's not fair. I I do agree with that. It's it's too much tax that they're taking. Forty five percent is half half of your earnings, and it's, it's big still, chunk out of your yeah, pie. It Thank is a you. massive. We'll have that. You'll do all the work. Yeah, we'll just have that bit. Um, what's your goal in this space? Uh, my goal is to have as many rents. Uh, service accommodations as well this could be rent to service accommodation or it could be buy to service accommodation I'm going more into the buying now I'm looking at buying properties uh, for to put on for service accommodation because um, you know if I've got them on a on a mortgage rate then the cash flow will be three times more of what I'm making now um, so I am looking at uh, buying uh, but long term wise uh, I'm looking to get ideally i'd want about 200 units so i'm right now i'm figuring out a way to get from 15 units to 200 units um that's what, what i'm doing right now and i'm also building a personal brand a personal platform where i showcase what i do on a day-to-day -day basis uh just building a com community of people that resonate with me uh and just helping others to and hopefully inspire others to get to reach their full potential how important is branding? It's very important. Have you I, always known what branding is? Uh, yeah, I'd say because, of course, I'm a younger generation, branding has always been smashed in the, smacked in our faces. So um, branding, I, I feel like, me, myself, I feel like I'm good at marketing. I know how to market. I could be better, but um, from me compared to an older person uh, i would say yeah we we do have um an advantage of knowing how to market knowing about branding um but at the moment branding i'd say right now it's very very big digital assets it's getting bigger um i feel like we really need to be leveraging and monetizing off building a brand and it's so easy to do so you know you can easily go on instagram be consistent post every day um it's not as easy as it sounds, but if you stay consistent uh, for like, you know, the next five years, you can't tell me that you haven't been, been able to build that brand that you wanted to build. Does branding have to cost you like £5,000, like a lot of money for someone to design colours, fonts, how it looks and perception? Or could it be as easy trying a few things yourself? <laughs> Um, I'd say starting up, it doesn't need to cost anything. You know, you can, social media is free. You can go onto Facebook, you can go onto Instagram. You can, you can start up and you can build yourself up. You can build your brand up to, you know, a certain amount uh, of followers, certain amount of, you know, engagement. But I'd say the more big you get, you will need to invest in advertising, um, ads. Uh, but starting up, it's really good to build a personal brand. So I think I saw something about a year ago, you had interviewed somebody who designed something for you. Is that right? Yeah. Something towards your brand or something yeah, like yeah. that. Like, could you tell us more about that? Yeah. So that was my, actually my first introduction to, although, yeah, I, I was saying that, you know, I, I know slightly a bit about marketing, but I it came to me that, I don't know everything about marketing. There's a lot of systems and procedures that you need to have to make sure the marketing 
uh, is going to be successful. Like, yeah, I can go and market, but how how much of that marketing is going to be, how much percentage of that marketing is going to give me the earnings back? So, yeah, I learned how to uh, build a brand, build a service accommodation brand um, because, you know, there's one thing where you can have uh, a title of saying luxury, luxury apartment with free parking. That's one thing. But if you have another thing where it says your brand name, so let's say in Dubai, they've got these brand names like Damak and what's the other one? Uh, they've got Damak and uh, Imar, Ima, Ima, that's the one. So we've got these big brand names where if you hear it, you know, it's got the credibility, it's got the trust. And with service accommodation, this business is about trust um, with with customers. You want to be making sure that the customers are trusting you. Uh, so I've went in, I've learned how to, you know, brand ourselves in order to gain the guests' trust for us. Um, and I'm also working with um, a company called IPRAC, uh, and they help to uh, ensure that where it's like a license where um, they provide uh, for more legitimacy and to provide more uh, security for guests when booking with us. Okay. What do you think has been your biggest failure or learn from what you've been doing in this business so far? Um, I think it's probably, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really call it a failure. It's just, uh, it's just the more of a, I wish I had this, uh, aspect so I'd say because um, I don't have much experience in you know all these corporate jobs uh, I don't have much experience in leadership um, so of course from not having this experience in leadership has 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 um, impacted me because um, I'm, I'm hiring all this staff but I need to know how to be a people's manager I need to know how to direct I need to know about all these different aspects of hiring um, and it's something that's new to me and I, I just wish I had the experience to know how to do this um, yes I can invest in mentors to teach me but I just wish I had the experience in hiring um, hiring staff uh, and you know managing staff as well because it plays such a big part in a hospitality business mm -hmm. how did you start leveraging your business in terms of people so instead of you spending three hours to start cleaning when was the right time to start employing a cleaner where did you find these people yeah so i used to post me cleaning on instagram and of course i thought it was cool but someone messaged me um who's quite big in the service accommodation sector and they said why don't you um why don't you uh, outsource this? And then I read it and I said, what does outsource mean? I, I didn't understand what outsource meant. And I looked more into it and it outsource means when you you give um, a lower skilled task to someone that's uh, more skilled at it. Um, and this is for me to grow my business more and it's not focusing on... Um, it's me focusing on more income generating tasks and not tasks that aren't generating me any money. So me cleaning was not generating me any more income. Um, and I feel like that was a massive mindset shift for me because this whole time I was cleaning, I was, you know, I was, I thought this was my business. I thought what I'm doing here is a business, but, at the, at, but the reality was me cleaning for my service accommodation units was, it wasn't a business because I'm I'm doing the cleaning. I'm not building it more. A business is where you know you're always looking at ways to increase the income, and you know you've got different departments for everything. So uh, I'm glad that person told me that because after that I hired a cleaning team to do the cleans for us, and it's crazy the amount of free time I had after that um, because before I had to be somewhere at a certain time. Now I don't have to be anywhere at a certain time. Um, unless it's to grow the business more. Is your business like fully automized now? Yeah, so I'd say so, yeah. So now I can be in a different country and the business can still run. I can I can uh, handle any problems from my phone. But now we've got um we've got procedures if for example if there if if there's a if there's a party going on, we've got a procedure for that now. So if a party happens, which is very rare now, because we've managed to 
uh, decrease the amount of times that happens. Um, but if it does happen, um, at my virtual assistant who who I've hired uh, from the Philippines, they get notified about it. They've got access to my my actual licensed security guard. They've got access to that contact number. They give the security guard a, um, a ring. They let them know about the location of the property, uh, how to get access to the property. They let them know about all the information. Security guard gets there within five minutes, five, ten minutes. And, you know, the because they're licensed, uh, they know how to deal with, you know, security call-outs and evictions. They can simply evict the guest and the, the virtual assistant deals with um, everything after that. So this all happened while I was in Dubai where, you know, a security ha call out happened and I only found out at the end of the day that this happened. So that's when, you know, you, you, you know that you've built a good system in place. And this, this business is all about systems. Um, and I'm, get, I'm glad that we're slowly building it more and more. So you've built a blueprint of something fully automized. Yeah. Like a copy and paste system if somebody wanted to start, really. Yeah, we're still improving it. Uh, but it's 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 crazy what systems can do and automizations. It's crazy. You talk you talked a little bit about traveling. Tell us more about that. How important is it to travel? Um, so it is very important to travel, in my opinion, because when when you when you live in the UK, um, you could argue, yeah, it's gloomy in here and there. Yeah, it is a bit gloomy because of the weather. Not the best weather and. Um, it's just a massive, again, mindset shift. It's about a shift in your mind. Um, you, you, I live, I, like I said, I don't live in the best area. So when I go to Dubai and I see there's villas on the palm, there's all these private gated villas on the palm. I, I see all of it and I see all these different houses. I see the way, the treat, how the treatment is there. There's a lot of, uh, the, the staff, they give a lot of respect to everyone. You know, it's a lot more respectful there. Um, how whereas the attitude here in the UK a lot of people are more rude a lot of people are more disrespectful there's a lot more crime here it just makes you think like you know if I didn't travel to Dubai I wouldn't want more if that makes sense I wouldn't want a better life for myself because if I live in the UK all my life if I stay in my city all my life I'm just going to think in my head yeah this is the norm it's it's normal to live opposite a drug dealer the drug dealer central it's normal to do that but in actuality it's 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 not the best environment to be in. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could expand to Dubai or something? Yeah, yeah. So uh hundred percent we 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 can we are looking into expand Dubai. Um, you know, Airbnb, they conducted this research where they were looking at the most um popular places and they came they so it's an actual research they conducted. Uh they said that Dubai is the biggest place for Airbnb operations uh, they said it's the best place to do Airbnb of course if that information is coming from Airbnb themselves you know success leaves clues if they're saying that I'm going to want to look towards Dubai and see if there's opportunities that can present them, themselves here I could imagine you you and Osmar going we're going to book this place if it doesn't work we'll stay in it <laughs> <laughs> I see you guys really enjoying yourselves um, is social media real? Because we see a lot of people on jet skis, boat parties, living the lifestyle. Is that reality? Because you're turning over a lot of money now, six figures. You've got money at your fingertips. If you want to go away, you can. Is everything we, we're seeing, are we really missing out? Um, it, It's hard. It's 50-50. Like, yeah, you could argue that it's not real. But if someone is on a jet ski, you know, you, you, you they are on a jet ski. But <laughs> the thing is... The, the thing is a lot of people don't show how they got there they just show like an easy way how they got there and I feel like I've done that in the past where I show myself on a boat on a jet ski in Dubai and but I don't say I, I make it look like it's easy but it's not easy and I'm trying to show that more to people that you have to work very hard you have to be very consistent you have to have more perseverance you have to work hard to get to this place and um i'm starting to post that more now uh, the last thing i'd want to do is glamorize this whole thing and say oh everyone start everyone be an entrepreneur it's amazing 
because uh, there are times where you know there are very hard times being an entrepreneur you've got it's very lonely as well it's a, a lot more stressful uh, because you know I'm having to wear all, a lot of the hats I'm having to wear you know all these depart different departments whereas if you work you know a normal a normal job you can easily switch off uh, but there's nothing wrong with working uh, you know a normal nine to five there's absolutely nothing um, it does it's very secure it offers good security um, but I just want a lot of people to know that being an entrepreneur is not as glamorized as you see it online so I'd say it's semi-fake but you know the, the people that are on jet skis they did work hard to get there Lena, tell me a little bit about your environment. Who are the people around you? How are some of your systems and processes around you? Do you do your bed in the morning? Is your room tidy? Like, how, how, how is, you know, how do you conduct yourself? So environment or like a routine? Um, I would say like everything around you. Like, so it doesn't have to just mean your routine because I know your routine can change because of work. But what is around you and how do you like your world to be? So um, currently, um, me and Uzma, we've got our, we've, we've rented an apartment. It's a, it's a two-bedroom apartment in a brand new area. Um, so I, I go there sometimes and I sometimes stay in that apartment. So I've taken myself out of, you know, where I live, or used to live, um, and I put myself in a brand new environment. And I feel like environment is a massive thing because um, I can't work if there's, if it's not silent, I, I need to work in a certain temperature uh, to do a lot of deep work um, when I'm doing any admin work. So environment does play a massive part. But when I was starting up, um, the environment I had, uh, you know, it, when you say environment, do you mean like where you, where I work? or Everything. Everything. It could be down to the environment in your head. Am I doing my bed in the morning? Because that says a lot about what you're doing. Yeah. Or it could be in terms of the way your desk is all tidy and you're organized OCD person down to who are the people that you're hanging around with. Yeah. I know it's quite a large sort of question, but I want you to interpret it how, how you say these are the things in my environment, what I see, touch, feel, and my routine or how I go about myself, you know, because you're very efficient at your business. You're very good at your processes. What builds this kind of person? What kind of life are you living? Who are the people in this yeah. this place around you? So I'm a massive, massive believer in waking up early. Um, and I, I learned this from my dad. My dad would always tell me, like, you know, you have to wake up early. to do, Even if it was just to go to grocery shopping, he'd always do it early in the morning. Uh, because if you do it late in the day, you know, it just gets busy. A lot of everything. You just get distracted by a lot of things. So I, I learned that from him. Um, so, so yeah. What is early? Early is like six a.m., seven a.m. Okay. So nothing, nothing like five a.m. I'm trying to get to that five a.m. stage where <laughs> every day I'm waking up at five. Do you think it's important to get up at five a.m.? I, I think it's very important. Really? Because you'd be surprised because if I was to wake up at five a.m. right now, I wake up at six a.m. It's so quiet. It's so peaceful. You can hear the birds chirping. That's true. Like you can get so much work. D- those few hours in the morning, so from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., it's so quiet. You can get so much work done. And you could argue 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., if you do deep work in there, you could argue that you can get more done than an average person would get done in 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Even though it's small, even though it's a couple of hours, you can get more done than an average person would in the day because you've got you've got a really quiet environment, you've got no distra- no distractions, your phone's not buzzing, no one is messaging you, no one is awake. And it, it's just that buzz as well where you're awake while the m- majority of the world is sleeping. Um, I think waking up in the morning is very, very important. And if I was to wake up one day at 1 p.m., I don't do anything in the day. I just feel like the day's failed. Mm. But if I wake up early in the morning, um, I have a routine where I have... Um, I have, to, I have to juice my celery. I, I juice celery. It's just, it's just become a routine. It's like, it's like uh, where you drink water, but it's, it's more powerful. So celery is very healthy. So I do that every morning. And you know, after, if you, to to make something into a routine, you have to make it a habit. And to make something in a, into a habit, you have to do it consistently for twenty one days. So of course, I've been doing this for for twenty one days, and now 
after 21 days, it's just become an automatic thing. I can't w- I can't go on with my day without doing that one thing that's turned into a habit. Um, but yeah, waking up early in the morning is very, very important. How do you focus yourself for 21 days? Like after three days, you're getting the shakes and you're like, I really want to go back to my old routine or, yeah. you know, for example, how do you overcome that? Um, I'd say you, you 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 have to ignore it. Um, uh, so a lot of people that let's say there's someone that normally wakes up at one p.m. and they're just starting to wake up at you know trying to trying to wake up at seven a.m. For the first few days, you're going to be tired. You're going to be you're just going to be moody because you're waking up. It's it's against your norm. It's against your habit. When we go against our habits, it starts to get itchy. It's not comfortable. Um, but we have to learn to be uncomfortable at times. Um, but doing that, it after a few days, the itch will start to go. You'll start to see the benefit of of that habit. If it's a good habit, you'll start to see the benefits of it. And then you'll want to do it more and then you'll want to do it more. So it all comes down to that. It's the same thing with fasting. So, you know, I, I'm Muslim and every year we do fasting um, for a month. So let's say one day I could be eating all day and the next day I'm fasting for the rest of the day. For the first few days, it's hard. But after that, it just becomes a routine. It becomes a habit. And, you know, we realize that it's healthy for us and you start to see the benefits and you just do it, do it and every day. And then once you start eating again, that becomes weird. So I think making thing, making good things a habit is very important. Mm. What else do you do? What do about your diet and gym regime? Do you go to the gym? So, um, not at the moment. Um, I'm do you not... have any hobbies that are more <laughs> physical? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I like hiking. Hiking is, um, I think, I really like hiking because it's it's a challenge. Uh, I think it was a while ago when I went to Mount Snowdon in Wales. And, of course, you know, you're going up the mountain. You just feel like giving up. And it, this applies in business as well. You feel like giving up. <laughs> like you can't feel your legs you just can't walk more but you've got so much of the top to, you you've got so much more to walk through um and that's where it comes down to if you want to get to the top even though you feel horrible you feel moody you can't feel your legs you if you want to get to the top you have to keep going you have to work hard you have to get up there and that's why i really like hiking um and because it's it's healthy to you know get some fresh air but i i really like a challenge and hiking is one of them how important is diet? Diet, I think it's very, very important. Um, with me, I, I really believe in eating clean. Yeah, I do have a few times where I have a few burgers, but this is where the mindset shift has come again. So, you know, I'd say more wealthier people, they look after themselves more because having having a healthier diet, it gives you uh, more energy. It gives you more, uh, a higher production weight. Uh, and being an entrepreneur you have to produce more you have to be you have to be more energized you have to be more creative if you have a bad diet you're going to feel moody you're going to feel horrible so having a good diet is very important to have more energy and to produce more efficient work so diet's very very important for me really mature answer i really like that (laughs) you you really got your head screwed on right like i've never you're making me think like I try to stay healthy and I'm like, why do I do that? But yeah. it is to just stay more productive. Like yeah. I can wake up in the morning and I can work the first half, go to the gym in the middle and then I can work the second half as well. I I, I don't really have a, a, a boundary or a filter. And I think yeah. if you're an entrepreneur, you can't say it's five o'clock and clocking out anymore. If there's something that needs to be done 7.30 to 9 or 10 o'clock, we, we do it, right? Yeah. And you've got to have enough energy to do that. And, I'll be honest with you, like, even with that mindset, it's about a year and a half or two years until I'm ill. Like, seriously, like, I think, oh, he hasn't turned up for work. He's not well. He's got this ache, that ache. He's got the flu. And I'm like, I swear to God, I go for a year or two years. And I'm like, hang on, I still ain't even been ill. But do you know what I do get ill is when I go on holiday, it's like, all systems down it's like yeah you can relax oh yeah. yeah you can get ill now by the way because you've got nothing to do i don't know like how's your immune system i'd say it's quite good now because i i make sh- i'm on top of what i eat what i think this is such when you look at all a majority of the mi- millionaires in the world what they eat is such an important thing they've even hired a nutritionist they've hired people to 
wake them up in the morning to have this nu- nutrition in the morning. They have they've got these dietitians diet- dietitians to feed them the correct food in order for them to produce more. And it is such an important thing. Not many people speak about it as well. People just talk about reading the right books, um, just uh, working. But no one talks about the uh, our internal bit parts where we need to eat the right. We need to sleep correctly. So I've just recently ordered um, an aura ring. So it's like a it's like a ring that you put on and it tracks your sleep. It tracks the amount of REM sleep that you get. Um, the amount of REM sleep that you get is very very important. So it's called it stands for rapid eye movement. Um, so again, it 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 gives the if you can track your sleep, then you can also track how much how good you're performing as well. Uh, so I've recently ordered that and yeah. That's interesting. Well, you have to let me know how that is going for you, or yeah. if I should get one ordered. Because it's like the, you need more things to track, you know what I mean? Like once you're working at optimum rate, you're like, well, how can I make this better? Yeah. That's interesting, that is. That really is. Tell me a little bit about um, relationships. Like, you know, you're a successful woman now. Like you're, you've are you got a business. Yeah. Um, in our Asian culture and society, you have working women, but you don't have many entrepreneurs or strong women and you're doing a lot of deals, you know, like do you feel that affects like who you meet or if you're meeting somebody or the shift into sort of, you know, cause Asian men do like to take in control and because you're earning more, do you think that intimidates them? Like what's your thoughts on all of this or what have you experienced? Um, I feel like it does intimidate a lot of guys, but I feel like it intimidates guys that are, are not doing enough. I feel like guys that are doing enough there, they are working hard. It doesn't really intimidate them. So I feel like, um, that with with working women, uh, women that are they've got their own business. I feel like there there is a pattern that because they also speak about it as well. Other successful women, they say, you know, a lot of men they feel intimidated by the am- amount of success they've achieved, but maybe they're just you know talking to the wrong men because most men that are doing great, uh, they're normally nice and normally not intimidated by anything. So I feel like it comes down to that. I feel like. Maybe it comes down to insecurities, because um, in, yeah, intimidation does come from in, in, insecurities. So I feel like it does come down to that. But with me personally, yeah, I have experienced, um, you know, some uh, times where the, the guys they are a little bit intimidated in and they portray it by being a bit rude or mocking what I do. But I know it's because they they haven't done enough for themselves. That's why they're putting it out on me. I already know that. So it doesn't really phase me uh, in the way it would phase others. Mm-hmm. And how do your family see it? Like wh- whatever you're doing and they know you're earning big bucks. Like yeah. you're potentially earning more than your dad right now and your brothers yeah. sort of thing. Like how is that? Yeah, so with that, um, I, it's, it's a tricky one. But I, I don't, I don't think even they, they, I don't think... <sighs> It's a, it's a tricky one because uh, they they want what my parents they really really wanted me to be a lawyer they wanted me to be or even a doctor anything that's traditional yeah uh, that's nice uh, that seemed to be good at ch- in the traditional values but um, you know when I started this business I didn't get any support from parents normally you'd think you know parents would be like oh wow mm. go on go on Jack normally. carry on with your <laughs> great business but I never got that and I just want people to know that. You're not gonna have. You might not have supportive parents, and you know you shouldn't let that put you down because I let that put me down. You know, it, it was really difficult for me um, when I was starting up. You know, um, with my parents, they they you know they, not a lot of nice comments would be made. Um, even my whole family as a general, they just they were just really surprised as to why. I'm not carrying on, carrying on with university. They were surprised as to why. Why am I doing this? Because they they saw this business as a man business. Like it's because like, they saw me doing a lot of heavy lifting. Because when you start up, because you got a lot of Amazon parcels coming in, so I'm having to put fit them all in my car. So they said to me, "Why are you doing a lot of heavy lifting? What is this? Like, what, you go be a lawyer." So I didn't have I didn't have any support. It was literally me alone um that's why I felt better to post on social media a lot because you know you get a lot of other people supporting you but family wise I never really got that support and um I'm still waiting for that support I think they still want me to be 
I think they still want me to be a lawyer. Um, it, it, it's really difficult because uh, I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of successful people, they go on podcasts and they say, I couldn't have achieved being a millionaire without uh, my parents allowing me to be creative. So when I hear stuff like that, it's just like, oh, it's it just it's not a nice feeling. But I, I'm here to say that, you know, if you, if you want to do something and your parents aren't supportive of it, just carry on doing what you really want to do. If it's more, if it's uh, morally good, if it's a good thing that you want to do in life, go for it. Take action. And if your parents don't support you, if your family don't support you, just just you're gonna have to ignore it. It's just noise. Um, it's just noise in what you're doing. And hopefully, in the next five years, they'll come back to you and they'll congratulate you. I'm of course still waiting for that congratulations. Maybe in a few years I'll get it. Um, but. Yeah, it's, it's it's hard when you haven't got the family support. Do you think that's what drives you right now? Um, yeah, I, w- I would say, yeah, it drives me. But of course, there's times where it puts me down where what's the point if my family don't support me? But at the same time, it does drive me because, you know, there's a reason why they don't support it. There's a reason because they're scared. They're scared that I'm going to fail. If everyone in my family thinks I'm going to fail, uh, and what am I supposed to think? I need to be the one that believes that I'm going to be successful. Um, from where I'm going at, I, I, we currently are successful at the moment. The company's doing great. We're doing great numbers. Uh, but to get to even higher numbers, uh, I'm going to have to work a bit more harder. But um, yeah, it, it has been a bit difficult to overcome that. I agree with you like when I first came out on social media just over 12 months ago it was like what are you doing you know why are you showing everybody what you what you've done and what you've got yeah. I'm like well this is how the world works now so I've got to change with the world or I'm going to get left behind um do I want to be an old school landlord just doing one property at a time or do I want to set up something that I can teach the next generation leave a print leave some legacy and maybe when you show other people what you're capable of and what you do they want to be associated with you you know it's easier to network like I've met some phenomenal people on this podcast and through influencing alone and none of that would ever have happened I would have had to some talk to someone's PAs of their PA to even get in touch with somebody so I think it's so important to believe in yourself because People like your parents do want the best, do want to do things in the best interest of you. But they're also thinking with their own thoughts yeah. and what they've been exposed to. So they put their thoughts onto your situations and put their fears on top of you. And that's just, a fear is just an illusion. You know, it's something that could happen. And I don't think, you know, when you're not fearful of it and you go, well, the fear is only if I stay in my comfort zone, I need to be uncomfortable to grow because it's yeah. only that time is when I'm going to really find my strength, right? 100%. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, just to add on what you were saying, like they 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 pref- they see a more stable stable job as security. Um, I mentioned this in another podcast where, of course, they come, they come all the way from another country to the UK for a better life they come for security and of course if I'm doing something that's out of the ordinary that's so random um of course it's gonna give negative effects to them uh but yeah recently there's been some talk in the news regarding um whether you can use your some of your places as like short-term lets because there's a housing market like there's a shortage in the housing market um could that be a threat to you guys and what are your some of your contingencies if there's a law that doesn't allow you to do your business anymore? Yeah, so what you're referring to is the there's there's talks, consultations, talks on uh whether short term lets uh should be more um should be more uh restricted and regulated. So I think this is a great thing. Reason being is because again, Dubai Dubai has many regulations for short-term lets. Uh, you need licenses. You need um, you need a, a more procedures in place to run your accommodation as a short-term let. In the UK, anyone can do it. Anyone can get a property and put um, put it on Airbnb, and it's not regulated. And of course, um, what this does is it brings anyone into the market. It's a low barrier to entry. 
a lot of people aren't doing the right things. They haven't got the right procedures. Uh, they haven't got the right um, insurances in place. And they are, if the, if they're doing the wrong things, they're, they're ruining the whole industry for the people that are doing things right. So I, what I think this is doing, I think this is regulating uh, the UK. A bit, and the UK does need a lot more regulation uh, in order for us to meet up to Dubai standards. Because uh, Dubai is it's about 30 years ahead of us. And for us to put this regulation in now, it's very crucial uh, um, to for this industry to be more respected. Um, and I feel like it will flush out a lot of competition as well because uh, I feel like it will do that and it will make people treat this as a real business rather than a side hustle. Um, it needs to be taken seriously. So I think with these uh, planning permission coming in, I think it's a great thing and we're, we're, we're preparing for it. We're speaking to councils about you know, what's going what's gonna to be happening, we're speaking to the local councils, getting as much information as we, are, as we need, making sure that we're ready for it and yeah. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, so in 10 years, uh, I've seen myself um, being in the in the millionaire stage. Uh, I definitely 100% see myself in that stage because um, I haven't stopped working since I started. Um, if, Of course, if I work every day uh, on this business, making sure that every day I'm building it more and more of course let's say every day i'm working four hours on growing the business in a week that's you know 28 hours building the good the business in 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 a year that's 52 times um 28 hours so of course all these hours i'm putting in it's going to grow and grow so i see myself being a millionaire in 10 years um of course other people might hear that and think, oh, what, what is this girl speaking about? Has she gone crazy? Um, but I feel like it's attainable um, because I've made it attainable for myself. I haven't restricted myself in thinking, oh, maybe I'll be a billionaire. Maybe I'll be a millionaire. Um, I do see it happening and it, it's 100%. What does being a millionaire mean? Um, I think it, it to me it means, you know, you have a lot more freedom, but for me it means like I've broken the scene. I've, I've, bro I've broken the, the culture scene and, where you know an Asian girl is a, is has is a self-made millionaire. Like being self-made, it means a lot to me. Where I haven't had any handouts, I've had to put in the work myself. Um, yeah, I would have preferred coming from a wealthy background, but uh, you know, it's it's nice to also say that um, I I built this thing myself. I worked hard for it and I earned it. Um, so it does mean a lot to me to be a millionaire i think that it's not even just the name of it it's just it's just um a representation of how hard you worked and you know and yeah does money buy you happiness um i wouldn't say it buys you happiness but i would say it buys you a lot of opportunities uh you know me retiring my parents of course that gives me happiness me um building building mosques building schools in in lower end countries that brings me happiness it brings me fulfillment and i think it comes down to that it all comes down to the fulfillment side of stuff um i'm not saying money alone is going to buy me my happiness i'm going to say that i'm saying the stuff it's going to bring is going to make me feel a bit more fulfilled uh in in my life is there a topic or a question you wanted to cover in this podcast um is this part being recorded yeah <laughs> oh, okay um um i don't know uh, uh if we just cut this part yeah, out sure um i don't know uh i'd say what do you think how do you think it's gone so far that really good really really good okay how do you feel it's gone yeah, yeah, I feel like it's gone, it's gone, it's gone good. It's really I just... done good. We've spoke about the business. We spoke a little bit about your journey. We thought when you're building your personal brand, this is what people are going to relate to now, like how your um, how, how your mind is, how you work. If if you're going to design a course or some academy, people are going to say, "I want to work with this girl because she's really nice, calm." And this this is stuff like this is going to help your stuff, which is why we're going a little bit personal. Because when people say, I don't see money like this or I don't feel like that, but she, she, she's relating to me. This is what's going to make you relatable and stuff. But I just wanted to know if you want to add anything um, else. I do on. have an e-learning platform. 
uh, where of course I'm showing every, everyone what, what I did and how I achieved it and ensuring just giving that um, helping hand and support to people that okay, I so know let, let's I wish talk I had. about that now before we sort of break it off Is that okay right? yeah yeah that's yeah? perfect and maybe have one question for me at the end as well uh, um, it's up, it's up to you. You, you you can ask me then yeah Okay. Oh, you don't want me to sit now. No, you want it? No, no, no. I like okay. to be on the spot. Put me on the spot. Put me in a corner. Put okay. a gun at me. I like, like that sort of stuff. Sophia, we're back in right now. Yeah, that's my editor, by the way. Um, so Lena, I really want to ask, um, how are you giving back to the community? So, like, in terms of, have you built anything to help influence some of the next generation or some of your peers who want to do something like like you're doing? So, I've actually started an e-learning platform where I'm giving the support to anyone that needs it really and the support that I wish I had when I started out. So I basically, you know, let I, I've come up to 15 units. I want to show other people how they can do it as well and how attainable it is. And it's all it's also about shifting your mindset to thinking low to thinking big. How big can you think? How big how how fast can you achieve things? How fast your life can change with six months of hard work and consistency? It can, your whole life can flip over. And that's what I'm co I've currently started. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a few people where I've, I've taught them exactly what I did. I offered them the support and they've managed to secure their, their first few units. Uh, that one person, they've got their first unit. Uh, they're actually getting the, collecting the keys, I think next week, actually. Um, so I'm going to go meet them and, you know, congratulate them for doing, achieving that. But it, it means so much to me how, you know, it was only just under two years ago where I was struggling. I didn't know, I didn't have a clue what I was doing, where I'm now offering the support of everything I learned, all the hours of YouTube videos I did, all the hours of book reading I did, all the networking events that I did. I'm now showing that to everyone and, you know, giving complete transparency of everything that I achieved and how they can achieve it as well. Um, and yeah. So if I picked up one of your e-learnings, how many weeks will I have to do it for to know what I'm sort of doing? So um, what we do is it, it's based on how fast you want to go and how consistent you're going to be. If you're working on, you know, calling more agents, calling more landlords. Uh, we have even a KPI tracker of, you know, tracking how much calls you're doing, how much, um, you know, viewings you're attending on. Because it all comes down to that, the amount, when, when you do this for so long, the amount of deals you need to see, with, with every deal that you get, you need to see how many viewings did that deal take? How many um, calls did that, view, that, did that deal take to get? And um, let's say I've did 25 uh, viewings of the 25 calls in a week and then I've, and that has caused me to get my first deal and then every week that number of calls will reduce and the number of views will reduce because I can see what I'm doing wrong and I can see what I'm doing right so that's essentially what I'm I'd be potentially showing you and you know just being that mental support being that mental accountability and physical accountability as well uh, and getting you to achieve you know your goals because I had a lot of times where I have a lot of brain mental breakdowns I just wish I had a mentor because if I did at the time then I'd be a way more successful than I am now don't you think 90% is mindset um I'd, I'd say I'd say it's I'd say it's 50 50 I feel like mindset does play a big role but you do need the knowledge uh, you really, really do need the knowledge and skill uh to build you know, get up to 15 units because it's one thing from getting your first unit and then there's another thing from getting your first five units. And there's a whole different thing where you get from five to 15 units. There's a lot of things that, you know, play into, you know, this business. And I just want to shift the mindset from this is not a side hustle, it's a business. You need to take this seriously. You know, you need to build these systems in place. There's a lot of systems that you need to play. There's a lot of, you know, uh, funnels in place where you're calling that, agents and landlords there's a lot of things that you need to put into place uh to efficiently achieve the goal rather than wasting time what's the major difference from five and 15 systems systems and um automations it, it really does come down to that you, you need to have strong systems to um build a business majority of businesses fa 
fail because they had never had the systems in place. Uh, and I think it, it comes down to that. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, do you have a question for me, Lena? Uh, I do, actually. Um, let, what, would you, what would you say to your... I'm 21, so what would you say to your 21-year-old self? Right. Um, I would say is make sure that what one thing we know is we don't know. Yeah. What we do know is we don't know. We never, ever know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't even know we're going to wake up tomorrow. That That's something within life. And we come alone and we also go alone. So you can only sort of rely on yourself. However, you've got to think with a positive mindset every single day because it's only you getting yourself up. Now, you're generating a lot of cash right now. Do businesses last forever? Generally not. Things happen in cycles. The property market is cyclical. It can be trendy when certain things come into play. Property is very different from 17 years ago from when I bought, bought my first one to now. There's a lot more regulation. You know, I, I know we live on an island. There's only a certain amount of houses you can build on an island population is growing so you've got to take a step back and see what's happening in the world right now and you've identified some of them things like dubai what's happening in dubai how fast is dubai moving so i believe diversification is key diversify don't put all your eggs in one basket if you've got 15 sa's rent to rent that is all your eggs in one basket it's working brilliantly now but we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what councils are going to turn around and say. And it was a big shock for me in 2013 when I built a HMO and then this system called Article 4. Yeah, when Article 4 came in, it meant you can't, they wanted more community housing and less HMOs. Now, the brilliant thing is if you've got a HMO already, you can rent all of the rooms still and you're fine and you can prove that. But what I was doing, I was doing a massive double story side extension to build this one and a half bedroom into a six bedroom house and I finished it and I didn't know about this article before I wasn't looking up on the council I was just I was working in banking and this was my side hustle as you say and uh, I'm glad I finished this project and I've rented the rooms 2014 goes by 2015 goes by and next minute all enforcement comes in knock with and they're these big red letters and they're quite scary it's like what have i done am i gonna get fined twenty thousand pounds and so they came in and they were like look you look oh wow like they weren't that bad as the letters would say they were really nice and they were like oh this looks lovely what, what, can, can we have proof of when this was done and i went well i've just done it in 2014 and they got oh no 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 like, like after 2013 regulation because they thought i was gonna lie and I wasn't here to lie. I was like, I literally done it in 2014, but my plans were submitted in 2012, 20, nearly 2013. But by the time I finished the build, it was 2014 sort of time. And so for something that I was going to earn three and a half thousand pounds for, and I was earning it at that time, I had to turn it back into a normal house. And then my income dropped down to 2100. That's nearly, you know, that's a lot of money. Like, a uh, thousand to fifteen hundred pounds that's like eighteen thousand pounds a year and i'm a small little landlord paying for this build cost so what we do know is we never know what's going to happen tomorrow so if you do have a pot of cash and you're cash flowing really good now i'd look to put that that passive income now i'd look to put it into some other assets like you've mentioned before like why not start buying houses now maybe use some of your resources and your systems that you have currently to scale that side of the business so eventually you're having your rent to rent essays but you're also you're having your the buy to essay as well portfolio and then if something was to happen on this side then you're still secure on this yeah. side if that makes sense so i would always look to put because sometimes you don't even know what's going to happen in your relationship you think I'm going to maybe get engaged to this woman. I'm going to marry. I'm going to have kids with her. You might even get to the marriage state and even that's not guaranteed. So everything in life is never, ever guaranteed. And it doesn't matter if you're a multimillionaire or you're a peasant. We still have our, our shit still smells the same. Do you know what I mean? You, 
you have problems, your problems might get bigger. You, you've got money to solve some problems, but you can't. It, money isn't going to give you that happiness in your relationships, in, in certain issues and problems and some of the businesses that you do with that inflict people. So always make sure you're being innovative. So if you have that opportunity of money there, say, hey, why don't we put 10% aside? So we've turned off 180,000. 10% is 18,000. Can we gamble 18,000 on another idea? Maybe a product. Maybe let's put something on Amazon. Maybe let's have a look at a problem or issue. Maybe let's make that a meeting in the week or the month and go, we do this on a daily call. Let's think of something fresh. Let's think of brainstorming these ideas. Let's see if we can, because we, we, we can gamble a little bit because we're not going to, well, let's just say we had a bad month and we lost 15 grand one month. Let's use that contingency to create, and maybe that would outgrow even what you have right now. So, Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. But, no, no, it was really helpful. I like to explain things properly, and I and I feel that just be open-minded. We never know everything, no matter how much we earn. You know, I might be earning twenty-five grand a month now. I might have a massive portfolio of multi-millions, but you can never ever know everything. Always be coachable. Always be open-minded, and always look how else can you do things differently because you now have a platform you've built a great foundation and now you can spring use it as something you can springboard off like hey we've built this hardware we've built a system okay we're now doing maybe e-learning courses that's another revenue streams we're getting rewarded for helping people what are the other things that we can be doing and like you're doing you're traveling have a look at things in other countries and go rah we could take that concept back to to London very easily and quickly and leverage that because no one else is doing that. Um, on this podcast, I had um, a gentleman come from Drinkfoot and he said he went to, you know, Germany and he saw these drinks that were, they, they just believe in local produce and farming and, the, and and they were selling their own produce. And he goes, well, I'm just going to take that back to, to London because I've never even seen of this, but this is just normal here. So all he did was just import this thing um, changed the recipe a little bit himself and now he's really innovative in his market challenging Red Bull and like do we ever think we can challenge someone like Red Bull it's one of the biggest brands but we are capable of so much and all it requires is a little bit of an idea a little bit of drive a little bit of a foundation but when we got that foundation make the most use of it because we don't know how long that's going to last for we really don't you know you can have good years bad years you could have covid years you know covid could be very bad for you but you could use it to your advantage and use it for key workers and stuff so that's one thing i'd say lena thank you that was really helpful <laughs> well if you just look straight at your camera and let them know how every my audience can follow you and see what you're doing so you can follow me on instagram uh it's lena x ahmed and i'm also starting a youtube as well so that's lena ahmed and yeah you can find me there uh, message me anytime if you if anyone has any questions about what i mentioned uh, i'll be happy to answer and there we go, guys. Let's say thank you to Lena. She's been absolutely brilliant. Um, she's inspired me that somebody so young could be driven, looking to grow and has her heights set high, really. And it should be inspiration to you guys to say, what am I doing? What, am I pushing myself? Am I leaving myself in a com comfortable um, situation? Am I being complacent right now? Because if I think a little bit outside of the box, if I step into bigger rooms, if I have right conversations, if I show other people my credibility that I am enough and I can perform for you, maybe you'll be achieving similar things. So I hope I hope you enjoyed this episode. And um, yeah, we'll catch you on the next one. Don't forget to subscribe, like, leave us a comment and share this with one of your friends or family that it could really help them. So see you on the next one. Peace.